Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is Jamie Smith and I am the Director of Planning and Marketing for Green Mountain Transit. Um, also on the call is Chris Damiani. He is one of our transit planners and Dan Jones from Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Uh, the project that we are going to be talking about is very much collaboration between Green Mountain Transit, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, and uh, Vermont Agency of Transportation. So today's agenda, uh, we're just going to start by talking a little bit about the current service that GMT operates in downtown Montpelier, um, a little bit of the service area summary, a history of the microtransit project, some current route performance of the three routes that we're talking about, and then a brief introduction to microtransit, uh, including a feasibility study that was conducted, um, a service model scenario that was studied in that feasibility study, a timeline of the project, and then we'll open it up for some questions and comments that folks might have. So to start, I just want to say GMT operates several routes in downtown Montpelier, but today we're actually just going to be focusing on three. The reason for that is uh, we are proposing to replace these three routes, the 82 Montpelier Hospital Hill, the 92 Montpelier Circulator, and then the Route 88 Capital Shuttle with this microtransit project. Um, the other routes that we operate downtown will remain uh, operational as they are now. So the Montpelier Hospital Hill route, for those who are not familiar, is a service that runs from downtown Montpelier to the Hospital Hill area, uh, Berlin Mall, Berlin Shaw's, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, that service operates Monday through Saturday and currently has a fare of $1. The Route 92 Montpelier Circulator is uh, two loops that operate in the downtown Montpelier area. Uh, they serve the Hunger Mountain Co-op, the Community College, uh, Montpelier Pool and Recreation Center, and National Life. And that service currently operates Monday through Friday and is free. The Route 88 Capital Shuttle is our seasonal service that operates between the Vermont Department of Labor Park and Ride, the State House, and National Life. So that, op that operates uh, seasonally during the legislative session. Um, and it's a, every 20 minutes from Department of Labor and that route is also free. Uh, in addition to those fixed route services, we offer some non-emergency medical transportation, which is transportation services for Medicaid eligible folks. Uh, we have a call center at GMT. Um, folks do have to call and schedule those trips. And then we operate some elderly and disabled services, which is uh, for folks 60 years and older and individuals uh, with disabilities and those trips are for non-medical appointments, usually uh, to meal sites, senior centers, shopping, um, pharmacy, and additional daily needs. So you can see in this service area, um, the three routes that we're talking about, and then the outline of this is the proposed service area for microtransit. And so this is about a seven and a half mile uh, radius in downtown and it had it goes up to the hospital hill area so just to talk a little bit about how this project came about um, in 2018 the vermont agency of transportation convened a microtransit working group to explore the possibility of on-demand transit in montpelier um, you can see from the participant list there were lots of people involved in uh, the start of this working group including Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, Capstone, um, the City of Montpelier, uh, et cetera. So that group in December of 2018 uh, issued a request for information to seek pot potential uh, technology vendors for microtransit. And in the end, they were able to work with two of those vendors, VIA and Transloc. And through the work they did with VN Transloc, uh, this group was able to develop a, a white paper um, talking about the benefits of microtransit. Via Mobility was the company that um, was engaged further. VTrans used them to conduct a service analysis and a feasibility study to dig a little deeper into what this potential pilot project would look like. 
And last, after the feasibility study, VTrans submitted an application for a federal grant that would support the launch of on-demand microtransit in Montpelier. Unfortunately, they did not receive that grant, which brings us to where we are now. So VTrans took uh, the opportunity to engage GMT further in the process, and they asked us to uh, be the primary operator for the pilot project. And so we took into consideration um, the strong local support for this project um, and the support by elected officials. We have lots of engaged community partners, as I've mentioned, which are will be integral to the success of microtransit. And so GMT and uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition will take the lead on the marketing and outreach efforts and a lot of the communication for this project. So then our biggest consideration is uh, we the three those three routes that we're talking about, the Hospital Hill, the Circulator, and the Capital Shuttle, are uh, none of those three routes meet the successful performance metric um, according to VTrans uh, metrics that they, they give us every year. So they look at lots of factors to determine if a route is successful or acceptable or underperforming, including two that I've listed here, which is boardings per hour, and cost per passenger. And so they look at these metrics and they determine if uh, the resources that they're allocating to these routes um, is being used properly. And so you can see that Montpelier Hospital Hill and Circulator sort of fall somewhere in between acceptable and successful on, the, on their chart. And the capital shuttle is slightly below acceptable. So uh, it allows us the opportunity to take the funding that we're given and operate this in a more passenger friendly way. So the three routes that we're talking about make up about 75% of our urban uh, rural system, sorry. And so losing those three routes would be a huge impact to the rural system. Um, that impact is made even greater by the fact that we transferred some service this last July uh, to RCT, and so we no longer operate the Route 100 commuter or the US2 commuter or uh, two services in Morrisville. So the percentage of service that we're talking about is pretty large for us. A brief introduction to microtransit for those who are not aware. Um, it's an on-demand travel model. It uses technology to help improve the passenger experience. It's sort of like Uber for public transportation. Uh, it allows folks to book their trips at a time that's convenient for them versus relying on a fixed route schedule. Um, and something that we talk about a lot in public transit is that first mile, last mile challenge. So if folks don't live very close to the fixed route, there's a challenge getting to and from that service. And so on-demand microtransit will allow you to go from point A to point B in that service area and it's really more like a door-to-door -door experience. So the Via Mobility conducted a feasibility study. And so what they looked at were all of these metrics, uh, providing transportation in areas of Montpelier that are currently underserved. So a lot of the neighborhoods downtown, um, they looked at the underperforming fixed route services in that area and looked at the the load, the passenger load, the ridership, the service hours, and they really uh, looked at what retiring those services would mean. They looked at that first mile, last mile connection challenge. Um, really, the, the purpose is to mitigate traffic congestion, reduce parking in downtown Montpelier, and is an upgrade to paratransit offerings because, again, it's not relying on a fixed service. It's more um, on-demand, door-to-door. And so the two primary goals that we're looking at for this service is increased ridership and improved quality of service for the folks in downtown Montpelier, and then upgrading the existing transportation services um, using the same fleet that we're currently using. So to, to start, Microtransit will utilize the small uh, cutaway buses that GMT already uses in downtown Montpelier. Certainly, there are lots of conversations um, at a state level about other vehicle options, electric vehicles, vans, 
um, if those opportunities become available to GMT, we'll certainly consider, um, you know, adding to our fleet as, as appropriate. So the feasibility study really looked at four scenarios. Scenario one was what would happen if we just replaced the three fixed routes. Scenario two uh, focused on replacing the fixed route service and the specialized on-demand service that we already offer in that downtown area. Scenario three looked at um, what would happen if we did scenario two and then there was an increase in demand. So if ridership, um, you can see here, if 20, 27 trips, um, is our, 27 is our peak hour ridership, what if that grew to say 35 people in peak hour? What would we need um, to operate that successfully? And then scenario four studied the same thing, but an even greater need. So if we had to add um, capacity because our peak hour ridership grew to 45 trips per hour. So you can see here, it gives us all the information we need, how many vehicles, um, how many vehicle hours, what is the average wait time if we had three to five vehicles, GMT is really starting this project focusing on scenario two. So we'll start just assuming a replacement of our fixed route service and our on-demand service downtown. Um, and given the metrics that we have in place right now, it's determined that we'll need three to five vehicles to operate that successfully, which would give folks an average of 10 to 15 minutes wait time. So if you look at a route like Montpelier Hospital Hill, that runs on our head headways. And so this provides um, some flexibility and a lot more convenience for folks who might need to get to that area. So the proposed service for now, um, when, we, when we launch microtransit, we're proposing that it will operate Monday through Saturday, Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. till 6 p.m., Saturdays from 8 to 6 p.m. And so those service hours were really determined by the peak uh, ridership hours that we have now on our three fixed routes. Monday through Friday, we'll have three dedicated transit vehicles on the road all day long um, from seven to six. In the event that this is a really successful program from the get-go, we do have demand response vehicles and additional drivers um, that we can utilize. So we can have up to five vehicles on the road if needed. On Saturdays, we'll have one dedicated vehicle in the early morning until 10 a.m. And then we'll add a second dedicated vehicle from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. So similarly, uh, it's a little harder to make changes on the fly on Saturdays because we don't have a dispatcher in the office, but we will monitor our Saturday ridership to determine if we need additional vehicles or additional resources for the following week. And so we will be monitoring and adjusting. So the timeline so far, um, Again, we started this process, GMT started this process in June. And so from there, we have um, conducted an RFP process. We issued that RFP um, that went out in June and we received 11 proposals um, at our deadline in July. So we conducted um, a scoring process. We had members of Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, VTrans and GMT on that scoring committee. So together we reviewed all 11 proposals and scored them based on a series of metrics. Um, in August of this year, the GMT board approved the implementation of the service as well as approved the RFP award. So we, we are working with Via Mobility on this project, um, the same group that did the feasibility study. And in uh, same time, um, August 18th, we issued that award to Via. So, Right now, we're in this October um, stakeholder public hearing and outreach process. And this coming Tuesday, um, I will be bringing all of the public comment that I've received on this project to our GMT Board of Commissioners for our final uh, planning process. So they will review the public comment and the final service design. Um, and then we'll start working with that microtransit advisory committee and all those partners that we talked about earlier to discuss the implementation, the marketing of this service. Um, and then we'll spend from now until the end of December um, on the marketing, the technology implementation. We'll have our kickoff meeting with Via Mobility. Um, the goal is to 
have them provide us some simulation, some, some uh, videos and some information that we can share publicly with folks. So we can really teach people how to use this service before it hits the ground uh, January. It says fifth, I thought it was the fifth, it's actually the fourth. So that first Monday in January is our uh, implementation date. And from, you know, between now and then, we're really hoping um, to do a lot of things. We're hoping to identify spaces where um, current riders might be able to uh, house a tablet or places where folks who don't have a phone um, can seek information. And so we do have a Montpelier Transit Center that's currently closed due to COVID. Once that's reopened, uh, we will have both a tablet station there and a, a customer service representative on site to help folks uh, navigate microtransit to plan their trips. Um, additionally, we have a call center at GMT. Those folks will still be available to help uh, riders plan their trip on microtransit. And so we're really hoping to, to dig into this process and to teach people um, this new service. So hopefully that that implementation um, is seamless for folks and really to show the benefit and the flexibility of this service. And so today is really um, just to talk about the replacement of our current routes. Um, we don't, we're not really prepared yet. Um, we have not had our first kickoff meeting with Via Mobility to talk about this, the actual technology at this point. Um, I know Dan is on the call and he has seen a simulation from VIA, so he might be able to answer some of those questions, but we will be um, conducting another series of meetings once we have some of that information. And so from there, I'll open it up to questions and comments from folks. Um. Yeah, I'm going to start with a question, uh, Jamie, because uh, I've just heard this from other places. Um, the hours uh, of operation, at least for some limited availability, there are people who have said, well, they work longer shifts and we're, you know, something where 6.30 in the morning to uh, 7.30 at night gives a lot more flexibility. Is there any way of talking about that for some of the vehicles or is that, uh, you know, a, is that your current experience and where you intend to start? So I think this is where we intend to start, Dan, but um, certainly we will be monitoring this regularly. And I did have um, a comment at our first public meeting on Monday from uh, Jim at CVMC, who was talking about his staff and their shift is from 7 to 7 p.m. And so I think you know, the, the standard process for GMT would be to gather some of that data. Um, I think if there are folks in expressing an interest that we should put out some, probably some survey information and do a little digging um, about what service hours might be most beneficial. And then we'll monitor the start of public of uh, microtransit and adjust from there. Sure, hopefully the uh, community advisory committee is going to be able to help with that as well. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Jamie, it looks like there's a raised hand from Rebecca Davison. Oh, I can't see your raised hand, Rebecca, but feel free to jump in. Um, I think this is fabulous. Uh, congratulations, you guys. Um, <clears throat> this is a long time coming, I know, and um, sorely needed, and I'm just hoping it will be a success. Um, one, of, one of the questions I have is, though, how does this work in COVID times? Uh, sure, so we will be using our same vehicles and we will have the same uh, boarding restrictions that we currently have, assuming those restrictions are still in place in January. And so essentially what would happen is when VIA is configuring the technology piece for us, um, they will set that boarding maximum in the app and the app will aggregate trips. So um, it's going to look at people's start and end destination and it's going to dispatch vehicles accordingly. And so the app itself will um, prevent us from overcrowding our vehicles. Great. Okay. 
Thank you. Can I, and, uh, can I say one more piece on that? Because this this was a um, interesting perception uh, we had uh, back in early days when they were only allowing two boardings per vehicle, and uh, the fixed route system, basically uh, like the circulator in town, only allows uh, you know um, one trip per hour. So we uh, you know my one of my staff members was uh, seeing. Oh look, uh, there are four people waiting in front of Shaw's, but only two can get on, and it requires a full two-hour trip to or hour trip to get it back. But with the microtransit, uh, as Jamie was just pointing out, the uh, you know that could be configured so that it could be back literally within ten or twelve minutes to pick up the other two people, even loading, so that we could triple or uh, quadruple the number of people per hour uh, handled even with boarding restrictions. Right, and Zoe, um, I see that you missed, oh, somebody answered you, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Zoe had asked did... which routes were affected, um, and so Montpelier Circulator, the Montpelier Hospital Hill, and the Capitol Shuttle. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, and thank you very much for the presentation. It's it's interesting to see this all starting to come together. Um, I'm just wondering about um, what what age uh, a young person would have to be to use this service. Sure. Uh -huh. um, so this actually came up at our first meeting as well. Um, internally, GMT has a policy in place that uh, children six and under can ride for free. Um, so we have another program that allows children as young as seven to ride the, the bus. Um, it's sort of a discretion call for parents, but we do offer some services that go to and from uh, local elementary schools. And so our restriction, um, we, we don't really have a restriction because oh. we won't be able to provide the service for those kids. Well, I guess what I meant is, like, how old would you have to be as a, like, a teenager to ride this by yourself? Oh, so I think, honestly, I think as long as a parent is, um, is willing and able to allow their child to ride, they could ride as, as young as seven. The, Jamie? Mm-hmm. One of the things that I talked to V on this, because we were looking for where school system support had uh, kicked in and other places around the country for such service. Mm -hmm. And they were they were saying where more uh, places were comfortable was 13. You, you, you can adjust uh, per you will. I, I was just saying what the national experience tends, uh, tends mm -hmm. to be about allowing people to ride without uh, parental uh, care. Right. So at this point, we don't have a policy that would prevent anybody from riding as young as seven, but certainly, um, and I, I actually just this week sent that same question to Via. So thank you for that, Dan, because I hadn't heard back from them yet. Um, we don't currently, Joan, have a policy in place for microtransit. It's definitely a conversation that we started this week. And well, so... Yeah. Sorry, I, I have a 17 year old, so that that's helpful for me. Yeah, 17 year olds definitely could ride. Yeah, but I'm also just curious for other parents because um, it would be nice if this, if this change doesn't then eliminate certain kids from being able to use services that they've been using so far. Right, we had a question on Monday about middle school age children um, who yeah. currently use the service to get to school. So. Um, the goal would be for this not to impact uh, any of our current ridership. Okay. Uh, so Liz has asked a question in the chat. Uh, what would the cost be for the rider? So at now, right now we haven't decided on the final fare, but it will be uh, roughly the same as the current fare. Uh, if I'm walking to the transit center to set up a ride, I no longer need the ride. Um, so Liz, using setting up your ride through the transit center or through our call center would be um, if you were scheduling your trip in advance. And so we, we have the ability to um, configure with VIA how far in advance we want people to be able to book their trips. We have some programs um, in place now where folks need to book their ride um, 24 hours in advance or earlier or by Friday at 4 p.m. when we don't have staff on site on the weekends. So the we'll probably mirror those exact same things. So folks will be able to book their trips in advance 
um, likely at least 48 or 72 hours in advance. But the but the mm -hmm. app will also allow for immediate response, won't it? Uh, yeah. yep. Right up to the time of the ride. They give you a 15 to 30 minute pickup window if you book your trip by when you want to be picked up. If you book your trip, say you have an appointment at the hospital at 11 a.m. and you say you want to be there by 1045, it will allow you to, uh, it will give you a pickup window that would guarantee you are there by your drop off time. So you can either schedule by your pickup time or your drop off time. And if you, right, if you don't have a, so she, Liz is also saying if she, if you don't have a phone, there would be no way to cancel your ride. Um, do you, that's, that's a good point. So when we meet with VIA, uh, we will work through some of these scenarios. Um, this is not the first time that has come up, but we are hoping to have tablet stations um, at various points in the downtown Montpelier area where folks can util folks without a phone could utilize um, the app and they could schedule or change or modify their ride from there. But uh, at least my understanding from the uh, uh, Jamie was also that with the app or with the call, you can also actually do an meet. you know, in other words, I can, it's eight o'clock in the morning. I'd like to go downtown. I can do a request and there's a, uh, you know, I, I could probably get a ride within uh, 15 minutes, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, they'll give you a pickup window. So it's not like I have to go 24 hours in advance. I could right. do it then. Right. So you can, it'll be up, up to 72 hours roughly in advance um, up to when you actually want to be picked up. So you can book your trip anytime in that time period. Jamie, there was a second part to Zoe's question earlier about how uh, microtransit will affect people traveling between Montpelier and Barrie. Uh, so it's really just going to affect folks on those three routes. Um, you'll still be able to get to Barrie on our other services that go from Montpelier to Barrie. Jamie? Yes, Bonnie. Um, I was in a group this morning where we were talking about it. folks were celebrating the uh, the social services sector was celebrating the transition to micro transit, but they had a question. Mm -hmm. If I'm in Barrie and I need to get to Montpelier, how will that intersect with micro transit? So micro transit will only be available to folks in that seven and a half mile radius of downtown. So they would still take the service um, from Barrie into downtown Montpelier. And then once you're in Montpelier, you can utilize the microtransit service. Would I schedule my ride while coming from Barrie? You could do that. How yeah. does it trans I guess the, the question is, how does the transfer occur with microtransit? Um, it depends on where folks are trying to go. But my guess, um, when we put out information, Bonnie, we what we would suggest is folks um, scheduling their trip as uh, from the Montpelier Transit Center. So when that bus from Barrie comes into the Montpelier Transit Center, they would schedule their micro transit trip from there. And that could act just like a transfer would now. So once folks get to the transit center, um, their micro transit trip or bus would pick them up at the transit center. Okay, they had some concerns about getting to the transit center and heading to wait another 30 minutes to once they've scheduled their rides, wait an additional 30 minutes before their next bus came. Right, the longer distance uh, buses typically don't go off track very often. So I think if they're scheduling their micro trip um, around the same time that their the trip from Barrie is dropping them off downtown, they mm -hmm. shouldn't have um, too much of a wait at that point. Great, I'll relay that, thank you. Thank you. So um, Elizabeth Parker actually put in the chat to me, uh, we will be conducting an onboard survey for folks um, who have questions or who don't have 
phones. And by then we will have some answers from VIA. We'll have had our kickoff meeting so we can address some of those concerns for folks um, at that time. Right, our, we've become very conscious of the needs of current riders, both for information on how this is going to work, how the transfer are gonna make, et cetera. So, uh, you know, as part of sustainable Montpelier's work with you is to uh, try and assess that as clearly as possible so that the current riders feel as comfortable as possible in the transition. Right, and we will be adding a page dedicated to microtransit on the GMT website. And so we will have um, what I envision as a, an FAQ section that would um, answer some of these common questions that we're receiving from folks. And then we can put the survey data and results up there as well. So the other thing that I put in the chat for those who didn't read my welcome information at the top, um, I'm starting a, uh, a micro transit mailing list for folks who want to stay involved and connected throughout this process between now and implementation. So um, I encourage folks again to sign in to this meeting via chat, but also to indicate if you'd like to be added to that mailing list. And if, if so, um, please include your email address. And you can send that to me privately if you prefer not to put it in the, in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, if they don't, I want to thank you, Jamie. That was very informative. It was a really good presentation, very helpful to understand for folks to understand it. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Well, my contact information is in the chat. Um, Dan, I'm not sure. Uh, yesterday, Laura put up the contact information for Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. If you'd like to put that in the chat as well. Um, we, Like I said, we're very much working on this, this uh, implementation together. And so no matter who you contact, uh, we should be able to answer your questions accordingly. Thank Jamie? you. We will uh, do it at the, uh, as, we, as you speak. <laughs> Great. Jamie, this is Bonnie. I've mentioned several things being in the chat. I'm not mm -hmm. seeing them in the chat on my end. Oh, you're not? Okay. I don't know if others can see it or whether they oh, want to you. Some of the questions, Bonnie, were sent to me privately. Mm -hmm. The information you just talked about with your contact information mm -hmm. isn't in the chat that I'm looking at. I don't at. see it either. I'm not it's seeing it either. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the easiest thing would be for me to give everybody my email address, which is Jamie, J-A-M-I-E, at ridegmt.com. And then for folks who might want to um, contact me by phone, my office number is 540-1098. Uh, so John Tarasakis just sent me a question. Um, will bus drivers accept flag stops? I think at this time we are not going to allow flag stops, John, um, due to the scheduling the scheduling nature of microtransit. However, if folks are uh, at some midway point on the route um, and going into a similar direction as the folks that are already on the bus, I think they'll be able to just schedule their micro transit trip and it will show up um, on the on the tablet for the driver. If, it, if somebody is requesting a trip and they're going to a completely different service area, the app will aggregate the, that trip with other passengers who are going to a similar location um, and it would dispatch a different bus. Will this presentation be available after the fact? I can certainly make it available. Sure. I can post it um, on the GMT website. Great. Thank you. Sure. 
Um, on our homepage underneath our service map, we have an area called in transit where there's uh, like a rotating carousel of updates and I'll make sure to post it there for folks. Jamie, question on the Hospital Hill? Sure. Um, so when that goes into the micro transit, will you have to schedule both the drop off and the pickup separately or how is that going to work? You could, if you are scheduling them, Liz, and you know your start and end time, um, you could schedule those trips together. Thank you. But the, you know, but one of the things is uh, we'll be talking with uh, GMT about this, but hopefully there will be a uh, for those who don't have a smartphone, a pad up at the uh, hospital that you could call because if you're like waiting for a long time for the doctor's appointment, it goes longer than you want. Uh, mm -hmm. You'd be able to request the ride uh, from the hospital directly. Right. Okay, so not hearing any other questions. Um, folks have my contact information down, put the contact information for Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. Um, and we are available to answer any questions after the fact. Um, my contact information is also in the presentation that I'll be posting on the website. If you're not familiar with the GMT website, it's ridegmt.com. And with that, I thank everybody for coming to the public meeting. And thank you. Sure. Thank you. I hope you all have a nice evening. Thanks, you as well. Thanks.